Hi class, welcome to part two of the lesson on speciation. So in part one, I introduced you to a few different ways of how scientists define the word species. And none of those definitions were perfect, but we then focused on the biological species concept, that individuals or populations are defined as belonging to the same species if they can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. And I told you that different species are kept separated from each other through reproductive isolation mechanisms. And those can be behavioral or temporal or so on. So today we will focus on how new species arise. So it begins with a genetic variant or sometimes multiple variants spreading through the population over time. Individuals that belong to this genetic variant may preferentially mate with each other. And as this goes on over a long period of time, eventually you may see additional morphological, behavioral, or habitat differences that arise. And eventually this leads to exclusive mating among individuals of the same type. Once these genetic variants are exclusively mating just with each other, they are now considered a different species. So the different types are now different species which are reproductively isolated. So we will explore two different types of speciation, allopatric versus sympatric. They are not the only types, but the ones we will focus on. So the main difference between them is whether the new species arise within the same geographic area or different geographic areas. So let's first take a look at sympatric. So in the simple graph axis, you have space on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. So let's say we have an ancestral population living within a particular geographic area. Over time, new species may arise, shown here in the filled out circle, and this new species arises within the same geographic area. In contrast, allopatric speciation, you have an ancestral species that becomes geographically separated from each other into two populations. And over time, these two populations become different from each other, and they are now different species. So we will first take a closer look at allopatric speciation, which just to repeat, so you remember, one species diverges into two species when they are separated by a geographic barrier. So to understand how this occurs, I first need to introduce you to this concept. When you, if you examined a variety of species across a large geographic area, you would most likely see variation in phenotype. So for example, in a classic study from 1972, they examined the body size of sparrows, which is the same species, across Northern America. So in the Northern parts, they observed smaller body sizes, but in the Southern climates, there were larger average body sizes. And this made biological sense. Most likely it had to do with thermal regulation because in the north it's colder and larger bodies have a more difficult time with thermal regulation. Anyway, the details of this particular study are not important for you to remember. The point that I'd like you to take away is that if you examine a, a large interbreeding population that are all the same species across a geographic area, you will see environmental differences such as temperature. And those environmental differences will lead to variation in allele frequencies and in phenotypes across this area. So the individuals from this part of the region could be very different from the individuals here, even though at this point in time, they are still one species. Now, over a long period of time, a geographic barrier may arise that separates this population into two. 
So over time, a river may form or a canyon or a new mountain range. This barrier now prevents gene flow between these two populations. So individuals from population A can no longer mate with individuals from population B. Over a period of time, you may start to get differences in genetic drift, differences in natural selection, in sexual selection, different mutations on the two sides of the geographic barrier. As these differences arise, eventually you'll get um, new reproductive barriers such as differences in mating songs, differences in the timing of the, mating, uh, of the breeding season. And gradually, once they are reproductively isolated, the two populations are now different species. So now that they are species A and species B, based on the biological species concept, if we carried individuals from species B across the river, they would still not mate with species A, even if they came in contact. And now let's turn to sympatric speciation. This is when one species diverges into two species in the same geographic area. This was controversial for a long time because it's a lot easier to imagine how new species might form in different geographic areas. But we now know that it does occur, and it can occur due to changes in chromosome number, non-random mating among individuals due to differences in resource exploitation, and non-random mating due to differences in mate choice. So we will take a look at these one by one. So first, sympatric speciation due to changes in chromosome number. So this is fairly rare in animals, but has been a common way through which plants have undergone speciation. So let's say that a plant makes a mistake during meiosis and produces diploid gametes instead of the normal haploid gametes. Now many species of plants have the ability to self-fertilize. So if this diploid sperm fertilizes the diploid egg, they can now form a tetraploid or 4N offspring. Now this tetraploid individual will be reproductively isolated from any diploid individuals in that same population. To form offspring of its own, if that plant has the ability to self-fertilize, it could do that or it can mate with other tetraploid individuals if they exist in that same population. So if there is ongoing reproduction of a new tetraploid population within the larger diploid population, the tetraploid individuals could eventually become new species within that same geographic area. Now, before I move on, I wanted to ask you a question. Think about it. Write the answer down and we'll discuss it in class. So based on your knowledge of meiosis, why is a tetraploid individual reproductively isolated from diploid individuals? Why would that tetraploid not be able to successfully mate with someone that's diploid? And now we will take a look at sympatric speciation due to differences in resource exploitation. A great example of that is an ongoing sympatric speciation event in Ragaletus pomonella, which is commonly known as the apple maggot fly. So these flies are native to North America. And in the past, they would only feed on hawthorn fruits. So these flies lay their eggs in the hawthorn fruit. The eggs develop into maggots, which feed on the fruit and gradually develop into the flies. Th these flies then mate with each other and then lay new eggs in the hawthorn fruit and the life cycle continues. Now, apple trees are not native to North America. 
When they were introduced here, these flies initially ignored them. But gradually, some of these flies did start to lay their eggs in apple trees, and today they're actually a pretty big pest within the apple industry. What's interesting is that whatever flies hatch on the apple trees, they preferentially mate with other flies that also hatched on the apple trees and then will lay their new eggs in apples. Similarly, the flies that hatch on hawthorn preferentially mate with other flies that hatched on hawthorn and then lay their eggs there. So these two subpopulations that live in the same geographic area and are right now still considered the same species are exploiting resources differently. And based on their different resource exploitation, they are choosing their mates differently. So this is a great example of a non-random mating, so non-random mate choice due to differences in how they exploit resources. And lastly, we'll take a look at sympatric speciation due to differences in mate preference. So when in the future, when you're looking for a future spouse, you will probably not do that randomly, right? You might have certain preferences in what you would like, uh, what you would prefer in your spouse. So you might not think of other animals such as fish or birds or even frogs as having preferences in terms of what they consider to be sexy, but they actually do. There have been a variety of studies on this topic, and here's one example which looked at a current sympatric speciation event in cichlid fish. So there's a huge variety of cichlids living in multiple lakes in Central Africa. So they took two particular ecomorphs. Ecomorphs are different varieties from the same species, and they looked at how the females chose their males. Now, interestingly, the females that belong to this bluish ecomorph chose the males from the same ecomorph 10 out of 11 times and chose the other male only 1 out of 11 times. Now, weirdly enough, the females from the yellow ecomorph did not show this preference. They seem to choose their mates much more randomly, yet still, the preferential mating seen in these females suggests that these cichlids might be on their way to eventually become reproductively isolated from each other. This study was done in 2010. There was a more recent study in 2015 that looked at cichlid ecomorphs from a different lake in Tanzania, and their study was even more involved. So they also saw non-random mating, that the females preferred the males from the same ecomorph, and they examined their genetics in great detail and saw genetic differences between the ecomorph that strongly suggested that they are on their way to be Coming different species. They called them incipient species. And interestingly, Charles Darwin, back in the 1800s, already used that phrase, incipient species. Even though he did not have access to all of the data that we have now, he realized that speciation is still happening today. And here's one quote from his book on the origin of species. He wrote, And I look at varieties which are in any degree more distinct and permanent as steps leading to more strongly marked and more permanent varieties, and at these latter as leading to subspecies and to species. So to summarize, let's look at this diagram that I showed you at the beginning. So in order for speciation to occur, a genetic variant has to spread through the population. Gradually, individuals of this genetic variant will preferentially mate with each other. That could be simply because they are geographically isolated from the other variant, or it could be in an overlapping geographic area where they might have different preferences, say, for the color of their mate. <laughs> 
gradually over time, additional morphological, behavioral, or habitat differences arise, and that will eventually lead to exclusive mating among individuals of the same type, and so these different types are now different species which are reproductively isolated. So to summarize, um, let's look at what you learned in both part one and part two of the speciation lesson. So in part one, I gave you some examples of different species definitions, with all of them having some problems, none of them being perfect. We then focused on the biological species concept, and I told you about various reproductive isolation mechanisms that keep species separated. And then in part two, I told you about how speciation can occur, either through allopatric speciation, which is when a geographic barrier separates a population and they eventually become different species or sympatric speciation, which is when new species form in the same geographic area. So that's it for today.